to brown. 뭐 the mountains were cleared of anything green. Eventually, they didn't look like mountains, just bare soil. The town sank into deep apathy. Many homeless people settled in the ice-cold railway stations, but trains rarely arrived. The orphans, who were too small, withered away and died. People had nowhere to sleep. In one song, where I lived, there is a train station which is always open. When people had nowhere else to sleep, that's where they went. Some small children actually lived there. The streets were empty now. Once in a while a car passed, people from the party or the state. The ones in high positions live well. They don't help anybody. Society had come to a full stop. Only the forces of oppression worked on. When somebody squealed to the police, people would suddenly disappear at night. I've heard they ended up in prison camps. But what about all the food that South Korea, Japan and other countries sent? I've never seen that or heard about it. Like the forces of oppression, propaganda still worked. While little children died before their eyes, people were told that they lived in a paradise and that people in South Korea and elsewhere were much worse off. I thought that we in North Korea were best off in the whole world. Kang didn't know better, so when his father, who had been in a camp, decided that the family should escape abroad, he was crestfallen. At first I said no, I wanted to protect the fatherland. My father said, fatherland, what country is that? What a shit country. After the interview, Kang's friend Shin comes around. We've decided to go out and have lunch before continuing the talk. There's an abundance of food in South Korea, and that is the only thing that the two friends really appreciate in the South. They feel rootless and helpless in this society that operates under a totally different version of the law of the jungle than they're used to. They were taught total obedience to higher powers. Here they're expected to make their own decisions every hour of the day. I've got a new cell phone, the newest model. <laughs> Time for food. Shin and Kang spent their whole childhood and youth in a state of permanent hunger. Until he escaped two years ago, Shin had never tasted meat, except raw fish, rats, mice, frogs and the like. No more of that. Delicious. We need to finish the story of Shin and his escape from the camp. We find a park in the center of Seoul. Shin rewinds the film back to the 2nd of January 2005. That is when he, as the only one ever, escaped North Korea's special control zone. Can I sit like this? Yes, that's fine. Or does it look a little arrogant? <laughs> he and his friends were 20 meters from the fence. Then they ran. Shin went first but stumbled so that the friend was the first to throw himself at the fence. Shin remembers that there were sparks and a horrible stench, but he climbed over the friend, burnt his legs terribly in the high voltage fence and continued to another world. He thought his friend was close behind him and found shelter in an empty shed in the forest, but his friend never turned up. Shin still doesn't know if he died in the fence or later. When I think back, that's the biggest sin I have committed. I still feel guilty. But on the 3rd of January, he woke up to a completely different world than the one he knew. It was North Korea, all right, but to him the degree of freedom he found in this prison community impressed him much more than the glittery and modern China and South Korea that he was going to see later on. 
Here people went around freely. They were wearing nice clothes. I couldn't believe my own eyes. It was a free society. He joined up with a band of rag merchants, vagabonding the deep frozen land. A few weeks later, he was at the river that separates North Korea from China. Shin crossed the ice. He was out of North Korea. In China and South Korea, there were skyscrapers, TV, radio, computers, cars and cell phones. That didn't impress Shin. It was just something that glittered. I didn't feel anything special when I saw the cell phones and television in China for the first time. I didn't think that I want that. They were just new and exciting things, nothing else. I repeat, my only wish had already come through. I had eaten and I didn't care about anything else. I still feel that way. Before we say goodbye to Kang and Shin, we're going to meet another victim of Kim Jong-il's regime, the writer Kang Chol Wan. Together with his father, sister and grandmother, Chol Wan was torn out of their home in Pyongyang and carried off to a prison camp in the mountains. In a few days he was reduced from a happy nine years old boy to a hungry, filthy little animal in a daily struggle for survival. Is it really possible that this, this can happen in the year 2008 and it's still going on? It's a fact. Many have experienced it. It can't be denied. One theory about North Korea is that the top leader may live in his own isolated bubble. Maybe nobody dares to tell Kim Jong-il about realities out in the real North Korea. He cuts his own population off from all information, but he himself has got television from all over the world. It's not that he doesn't know what's going on in North Korea. The brutality of his system has just grown and grown to the point where he now fears that everything will collapse and that he will suffer the same fate as Ceausescu of Romania. That's why he does everything to stay in power and kill all his opponents. Kang Chol Wang is critical towards South Korea's so-called sunshine policy towards the North, a sort of let's all talk nicely to each other policy. He thinks that it may be the actual reason why Kim Jong-il is still in power, that and the food relief from abroad. Food and money is sent for humanitarian reasons, but humanity doesn't exist in North Korea. But humanity does exist among common North Korean people. That becomes evident as we say goodbye to Shin and Kang one afternoon in Seoul. This is to celebrate that we have met. When you return to Denmark, you must never forget him and me. We have been to the Namsan Tower together. That too calls for celebration. Thank you, thank you too. Don't forget us.